Um, but uh, today, uh, we're going to look at a passage that is a, a very familiar uh, passage in the Bible. You know, most people know of this passage in the Bible. Um, but before we get to that, I just want to remind everybody that in the Bible, it calls us sheep. Jesus calls us his sheep. There are all types of times in the Bible where the Bible calls us sheep, and Jesus himself also calls us his sheep. In Psalm 103, it says, We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. In John 10, verse 10, Jesus says that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But he says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And then he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then later in verse 14, again, he says, I am the good shepherd. So he says, I am the good shepherd. And I am glad that he is the good set shepherd since I am a sheep. Because I don't know if you know this, but sheep are some of the dumbest animals on the planet. <laughs> they are some of the dumbest animals alive. I have seen videos of the shepherd pulling the sheep out of the ditch and the sheep running and going right back in the ditch. And the shepherd pulls it out of the ditch and there it goes running and falls right back in the ditch again. It just keeps falling in the ditch. But not only that, but sheep, they, they can't feed themselves either. Like, they have to be led to pastures. They can't go out and find food like some of the other animals can. The shepherd has to lead them to the food for them to eat the grass. Like, they have to bend down and eat it, but the shepherd has to take them there, or they're just going to starve. And, you know, today it's... Sometimes I wonder if uh, God looks at us like that sometimes, like... With just these sheep running around, like, what are they doing sometimes? <laughs> what? I told them to go over here, they, what are they doing sometimes? And, um, you know, sometimes we don't think of ourselves as sheep because, you know, we think of things like, well, can't I read the Bible for myself? I can read the Bible. And yeah, we can read the Bible for ourselves. We all have can read it, you know, but we need the Good Shepherd to help us understand the Bible, to reveal it to us, to help us to understand what it's saying. You know, we are sheep. We can't do anything by ourselves. You know, last week, Jesus said, I am the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from him, we can do nothing. We're sheep. We need to be led by the shepherd. And so today, the passage we're going to be in is Psalms 23. A very familiar psalm. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. And so we're going to start in verse 1. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And before we go any further, I want to point out that, you know, he says, The Lord is my shepherd. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The Lord is our shepherd. We are sheep. But I want to point out that in there it says that I shall not, that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That word want doesn't mean what we think it means sometimes. Where in the Hebrew the word want in this passage really means lack. Where he's saying you will not lack anything. You will lack nothing. You shall not lack is what it means. And I want to point that out because we can read that and think won't. Like he's going to give me what I want. But it's not he gives me what I want. He gives me what I need. That I will not lack anything. I will lack nothing. And we need to understand that between the need and the won't. Because, uh, for example, let's look at the people of Israel the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. Whenever Jesus came, 
they wanted him to be, they wanted a military leader. They wanted a king to come and overthrow the Romans, a military political leader that was going to overthrow the Romans. That's what they wanted. But what they needed was a Messiah. What they needed was a Savior. And that's what we need. What we need is a Savior. And he provided not what they wanted, he provided what they needed. And so the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. That doesn't mean I get everything I want, but it does mean that he's going to provide, he's going to give me everything that I need. If I need it, then the shepherd will provide it for me. But sometimes what we think are needs and what he thinks are needs are very different. It's very different because in our vocabulary we say things like I need this, but what we are really saying is I want this. You know, like we say things like, I need a new TV. You don't need a new TV, you want a new TV. Because, you know, a TV is not a need, it is a luxury. It's just sometimes we forget that, sometimes, about what our needs really are. And so sometimes we go and it's like, we ask God, we, you know, we want something, and it's like, well, what is he doing? Like I read this verse and it's like he says that you know he's going to give me everything I want. I will not want. I need a new TV. He still ain't gave me a new TV. So what's going on? And we get frustrated with him whenever it's like he doesn't see that as a need sometimes. But he will give us everything that we need. Because sometimes it's we say we need things and it's almost like people think that you know, they're going to die if they don't have it. Like, we don't have a TV that we're going to die. I mean, you know, just look at young people today. If they have no internet, no phone service, it's like they don't know what to do. Like, they're going to die sometimes. That's how it seems like they feel. I can say that now. I got older this week, okay? I can say things like that now. But the thing is, is that our, what we think our needs and what God thinks our needs are different. But He will provide all of our needs. We just need to know what God sees as needs and what we see as needs. What does God see as, sees as our needs? It's going to provide for us. Food, clothes, you know, water. And most of all, He's going to provide for all of our spiritual needs. I mean, where were we? We were in great need of a Savior, and He provided through His grace, through His mercy, Jesus. He provided for our need there, Jesus, to save us from our sins. So the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not lack. I will not lack. Because he provides us for me. And then in verse 2, he tells us something else that he provides for us. It says, He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside still water. So he provides green pastures and still water. And I think that green pastures and still waters represents contentment and peace that he provides for us. Because the sheep, a sheep that has green pastures is very content. Because they have the food, they have what they need. They're very content. And in the Bible when it talks about still waters, still waters represents peace in the Bible. Well, our lives as believers should be characterized as this contentment and peace. But sometimes we don't have that contentment and peace sometimes in our lives. Sometimes it's because we've gotten away from the shepherd because the shepherd leads us to this contentment and peace. He's the good shepherd. He makes me lie down in the green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. And Paul understood this. Paul, in uh, Philippians 4, he says, verse 11, he says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry. 
whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Or Paul says, in any and every circumstance, I know what it is to be content. And Paul says that he has contentment because he knows that in all things, he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. In other words, what he's saying is that I know that my shepherd is going to provide for me. So whether I have a lot or whether I have a little, I know I can be content knowing that he is going to take care of me. He will provide all of my needs. But also, when we come to church, in that contentment, in that peace, that is provided. When we come to church, we should experience that. We should experience that contentment, that peace when we come in here. Because when we come to church, we can experience that peace here. And we can also eat of the green pastures. In the Sunday school lesson, in this hour, where we're reading the Word, we're eating, we're chewing on God's Word. We can have that peace, that contentment. And... We can come here and have that peace and contentment, but we need to know that one time a week is not enough. Like, we wouldn't just eat one time a week. We can't just eat from the green pastures one time a week. It needs to be a continual thing of all throughout the week. Because God does not want, like, a weekend affair with us. He wants to marry us. He wants, we're called the bride of Christ. The church is called the bride of Christ. Right? Yes. And he provides green pastures for us, but he wants to provide that for us every day of our lives. But we have to come to him and get in his word and pray. And we need that because our weeks get so busy. Every one of our weeks gets so busy, and if we don't have some green pastures and some still waters, we're in some trouble. Would you agree with that? Especially in the world that we live in, we will have trouble. That's why each and every time we've got to come to Him and let Him give us that peace that only He can have, give us that contentment. <coughs> because in the world today, there's so much that we can get anxious over. There's so much trouble that comes. And each and every time we feel like we start to get overwhelmed, that's when we need to come to the Good Shepherd. Let us get that contentment, that peace. Because the further we get away from Him, the less peaceful we tend to be. The more trouble seems to come in our lives as well. And so the Shepherd leads us to these things. And the shepherd has to lead the sheep there because, you know, again, the sheep, not the smartest animal, is not going to go be able to go and find the green pasture by itself. He needs the shepherd to lead them there. But not only that, but they have to bend down to eat. That means that if the sheep doesn't bend down, the shepherd can lead them there, but if the sheep doesn't bend down to eat, it's still going to be hungry. And in the same way, God, Jesus, can lead us to the green pastures, to the still waters, but if we don't take time to sit and be with him in his presence, then we're not going to be able to have that contentment or that peace that comes. We've got to take the time to spend in his presence and just eat <laughs> his word. Then in verse 3, in verse 3 it says that he restores my soul, or he refreshes my soul. So I want to ask you a question of, has your soul ever been crushed? Has anyone's soul ever been crushed? And in the Hebrew here where it talks about the restored or refreshing of my soul, it's saying that it's restoring something that has been injured, is what it's meaning. It's restoring something that has been injured. So he restores my soul. And 
a lot of times we don't use the phrase, my soul has been crushed, but we do use the phrase, my heart has been broken. How many times, how many people's hearts have been broken? Every one of us at some point in our lives, hearts has probably been broken. And you know, our hearts get broken, whether it be, you know, that could be a loss of a loved one, you know, loss of a friend, loss of a job, uh, some health struggles. Any of those things can break our hearts and it's normal. It's normal for our hearts to be broken in this world because there are troubles that come. But there is someone who can restore the broken heart and restore our soul. And there are two verses that Jesus quotes in Isaiah. And Isaiah wrote these 700 years, about 700 years before Jesus even came. And he quotes these two verses about himself. The first is in Luke 4, verse 18, where it says, Jesus said, He has sent me, he's saying, The Father has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And then in Matthew 20, in Matthew 12, verse 20, he says, A bruised reed he will not break. And what he's saying, he's saying that. He's not going to break it. He's not going to come along and see something wounded and break it. It's not going to... If our hearts are hurting, our hearts are bruised, He's not going to come along and break it. He's coming along to heal it. He's going to restore it. Saying a bruised reed, He will not break. He's going to bind the wound up and heal it. And in Matthew 12 there where He says that right before that, the, uh, the Pharisees get mad at him. Pharisees get mad at Jesus. And they got mad at Jesus because he had just healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. So he healed someone on the Sabbath and they got mad for him healing someone on the Sabbath. Where he was, they were saying, you know, you're not supposed to heal anyone on the Sabbath. You know, that's why all the doctor's offices are closed on the weekend. And you're supposed to heal on the Sabbath. Way it seems sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> With the doctor's offices. But they were mad at Jesus because he healed on the Sabbath, where he they were like, he's not supposed to do that. He's not supposed to heal on the Sabbath. They said that was work on the Sabbath. He can't heal someone on the Sabbath. And then he tells them, he says, Which of you? And I think when Jesus says something, it's perfect put in a perfect place when he says things. Where he says, Which of you, if you have a sheep that falls into a pit on the Sabbath, would not go and pull him out on the Sabbath? So again, he's the shepherd, and we are the sheep. And he had just healed a man with a withered hand. And he was saying, If someone has a sheep that falls into a pit, you would go and pull it out. And then he says, isn't a person much more important than a sheep? So he's saying, if you fall into a pit, would he not come along and pull you out? So he said, I healed this man with a withered hand because he needed me. He's my sheep. He needed me. He needed the shepherd. And in our lives, there has been times where I'm sure we have all fell into pits. Our hearts have been broken, our souls have been hurt, so we fell into a pit. And it's like you're going along, everything's going great, and then something happens and you end up in the pit. Your heart is broken. And there's nothing you did wrong, you just ended up in the pit. The sheep, when it's running, doesn't mean to fall into the pit. It just does sometimes. And so sometimes we end up in the pit, and it's nothing we did wrong, but yet our hearts are still broken during those times. Or there's other times where someone else pushes us in the pit. You know, I think of Joseph and all his brothers. Joseph's brothers threw him in the pit. Joseph didn't do anything wrong. And he ended up in the pit. And there's also uh, another time where you can end up in the pit. That I have a lot of experience so in. Is sometimes you dig the pit yourself and you fall in it. And we end up in the pits and it's our own fault. 
where I dug it myself and I fell into the pit. Anybody else done that? Anybody else dug their own pit that they fell in? I think we all have at some point in our life where it was our fault, we did the wrong and we ended up in the pit because we dug the hole and we fell in it. We dug it ourselves. There's many times where we've done that. And uh, there are many people that uh, maybe like me sometimes don't know when to stop. And you just keep <laughs> digging <laughs> the hole. That's what I do a lot sometimes. Sometimes I don't know when to stop. And uh, probably a lot of the married men know what I'm talking about. You just keep digging sometimes when you know you should stop. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but you know we're all guilty of that we know that it's wrong but yet we still kind of dig right it anyways digging. keep right on going and dig it don't ask Victoria how many times I've done that or James, or James. <laughs> but we do though it's just it's something that we do that we dig it ourselves and we just can't stop and we end up in the pit but the thing is is that even if we end up in the pit ourselves, the shepherd's still going to come and pull us out of the pit that we dug ourselves. He's still going to pull us out because he is good. He is the good shepherd. But those times when we end up in the pit, whether it be our fault or our own fault, our hearts are broken, and we are very down and downcast there in those times. Where there are times where something happens, and it's like our hearts are broken, and it's like we need Him to come and restore our heart. But there's also those times when it's our fault, we dug the pit, we're in there because of our own failure, our own faults, our own sins. And we're broken hearted that way too, and we still need Him to come and restore us and get us out of that pit. And uh, in Psalm 51, it's a psalm of David. And David writes this song after he repents or... He writes it as he's repenting after he has committed adultery with Bathsheba. And so David is writing this song in Psalm and he is in a pit that he dug. He committed adultery. He dug the pit that he is in. And it's a great song. And in that song, in verse 1, the first thing he says is, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love. There's been many times that I have messed up in my life. It's been my own fault. And every time I mess up, I think about this song. I think and I repent and have mercy on me, O oh God, according to your unfailing love. And then in verse 12, he says, He restores me with the joy, or he says, he has restored to me the joy of your salvation. Where he's saying, I have repented, and I've come back to him, and he has restored the joy to me. In a way, he's saying, he restored my soul, even after I was the one that went and fell in the pit and messed everything up. He restores my soul, even if it's my fault, that he restores my soul. But I have to come and repent and come back to Him for Him to restore my soul. And I think in, right now, in this world, there are a lot of people who need that. Who need the Good Shepherd to come and restore their soul because we get defeated, we get discouraged so easily in this world that we live in. Christians, non-Christians, we get discouraged and defeated. That's why we need to have those times we come to Him and spend time in His presence to lift us up, to give us that joy back in our lives. Then He says in Psalm 23, He says, He guides me along the path, along the right path for His name's sake. Or what he's saying is he says, you know, he's leading me on the path of righteousness for his name's sake. So the good shepherd provides those good and right paths, these paths of righteousness. 
And when I think about a path, I think about, you know, you're walking in the woods and then you see a path that you can walk through. But you have a choice. You can walk along the path or you can walk over there and go try to go through the briars and the thorns. But you have a choice to walk through the path. And we all have a choice whether we can walk the right path or we can choose to not walk the right path and have all them troubles and everything come in our life. And the word righteousness, what it means is right standing with God. It's what it means, right standing with God. And so we, we are put in that right standing with God by His grace, through faith in Jesus. It's nothing we did. It's by His grace that we can be put in that right standing with God. The Bible is very clear that it's by grace, through faith, that we are saved in Jesus Christ. And so we are put in right standing. Jesus was able to help me to become, be put in the right standing before God. Washed, covered in the blood of Jesus before God. But then we sin and we mess up that standing between us and God. And what I'm saying and what I mean by that is in, is in Psalm 32. It's another Psalm of David. In Psalm 32, in verse 1, um, he says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one who, whose sins the Lord does not count against them, and who and in whom and in whose spirit is there is no deceit. And so what he's saying there, he's saying that's what? That's God's grace. Through faith in Jesus, our sins are forgiven. They're covered by the blood of Jesus. And then he says that um, whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Basically saying, you know, sin is taken out of our account. We're no longer held guilty for those sins. It's been taken away from us. We have been forgiven and it's because of God's grace. So we are in that right standing with God through grace by faith. But then in verse 3, David here, he's talking about his own sin. And he says, when I kept silent, in a way he's saying, when I didn't repent, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away, though my groaning, through my groaning all day long. So basically David was saying was that it affected him. He's saying, you know, I'm in that right standing with God. He's forgiven my sins. But I kept silent and I did not repent. And because of that, it affected David's relationship with God. Not God's relationship with David. It affected David's relationship with God. Because God still loved David. But because of that sin, it messed that up on David's part. And then in verse 4, he says, For day and night your hands were heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. So David here, he says, you know, it was weighing heavy on me. In a way, it was a burden. It was messed up, that relationship between him and God. But then he said, then I repented. And then he says, my transgressions, the Lord, you forgave the guilt of my sin. And that word guilt there, the guilt of my sin, kind of means like the weight of sin. Where he says, you know, when I confess, that weight was kind of taken off of me. I was forgiven. The guilt was taken away. That weight that was pushing me down was taken off of me when he repented. And so God leads us on the path of righteousness. And it's so that we don't have to be weighed down by those sins every time we go somewhere. 
We know that our sins are forgiven. But the devil keeps bringing them back up. God doesn't bring back up our sins. The devil does. He's cleansed us of those sins. But we have to walk with him in that good standing, in the path of righteousness. We follow him and not the world. Because all through uh, Psalm 23, it talks about how he leads me. He leads me by the still water. He leads me to the green pastures. He, you know, he restores my soul. He leads me on those paths of righteousness. And that leading, I think, is what we need to understand because shepherds do not drive sheep. You know, like you have cattle drives that they drive the sheep, or drive the cattle, they have those. There's no sheep drives. The sheep are led. And sometimes I think we forget that, because sometimes we think, we kind of feel like God is behind, pushing us. He's driving us, but really he's in front of us saying, follow me. He's leading. And I think of it like this. There's when we think of sheep, um, you know, no one really herds sheep around here. <laughs> but where they herd sheep, um, if all the sheep were in a field, like let's say there's different flocks that come and they all come to this same place. So these different shepherds lead these different flocks to the same place to eat from these, uh, this pasture, to graze at this pasture. When it's time to leave, one of the shepherds will get up and say in a loud voice some word. They'll say it, and he'll just start walking, and all of his sheep will follow him. And then the next shepherd will get up, and he'll say, you know, his word, and all his sheep, he'll walk a different way, and all his sheep will go that way with him. They'll all just go that way. And they keep doing that until, you know, all the shepherds, you know, say their word, all their sheep go and follow him. Says the word, he takes off, the sheep go with it. And they keep doing that until all the shepherds have left. And when they do that, there would be no sheep left eating in that pasture. They would all leave with the shepherds. And the crazy thing is, is that no sheep would get mixed up. Because the sheep know the shepherd's voice. So when the shepherd calls and he starts walking, all the sheep follow him. Because they know the shepherd's voice. And Jesus said... My sheep know my voice. I know my sheep and they follow me. They know my voice. They follow me. And so what is the key to following the shepherd? It's very simple. You hear his voice. The sheep hear the voice of that shepherd and he'll follow him. They ain't going to follow the other one. They don't know his voice. They don't know who that is. But they know their shepherd and they follow their shepherd. And they will follow him when he calls. So the key to following the shepherd is hearing his voice. But what is the key to hearing his voice? It's spending time in his presence so we can hear his voice. That is the key. Sometimes we try to make it too complicated. But it's very simple. The sheep know the shepherd's voice. And we can only know the shepherd's voice... By spending time with him, reading his word. And even though the sheep know the shepherd's voice, they're still prone to wander away. It's true with regular sheep and it's true with us. We're still prone to wander. We're still prone to fall into pits. And we need the shepherd to come get us. You know, Jesus tells many parables about sheep. Where he says, you know, one sheep wandered off. Won't the shepherd leave the ninety-nine to go find the one? Sheep tend to wander sometimes. But the thing is, is that we can take comfort in knowing that the shepherd loves us and he provides for us. And if we fall into the pit, he's going to come and help us get out of the pit. And a lot of us here have been Christians for a very, very long time. Some people in here have been Christians probably longer than I have been alive. <laughs> But we've been Christians for a very long time. But it doesn't matter how long we've been Christians for. 
We all still have to spend time in His presence. We all have to spend time with Him and let Him lead us to the green pastures, to the still waters. No matter how long we've been Christians, we all have to go somewhere and get alone. Worship God. Pray. Get our minds off of our problems and on His presence, on Him. And get in His Word every day. Because if we don't, that's when we start wandering off and falling into the pits. Whenever we get our eyes off of Jesus, off of the shepherd. Because when we are in his presence and the shepherd speaks, he leads us to those paths of righteousness. He leads us in these places. And I want to close in prayer, but as we're praying today, I really want us to think about because... We need that as a priority in our lives, of these times with God, spending time with God. Because we know that we do better when we spend time with God. We know that we have more peace, we have more contentment when we spend time with Him. We know we have more joy when we spend time with Him. We know we're less anxious when we spend time with Him. We know that the day seems better when we're spending time with Him, when we're praising Him. And we know that when we go through difficulties and our soul is crushed, that we can come to Him and He will restore our soul. We know that He will lead us through these paths of righteousness. We know this and yet sometimes we don't take the time to keep coming back to Him and having Him fill us with joy. And with peace. And have y'all ever seen those uh, those trucks that come, those big tanks on the trucks that come and fill up the gas station? You seen those things? They go and you know they under the concrete. There's a tank that they fill up, so we come and we can fill our cars up and get gas. Sometimes I think that we're like those trucks that we drive around. And we're filling up people. You know, we fill people up. We try to give them the word, whatever. But also, you know, each and every day it takes strength, it takes effort out of us to go to these places and go in these places. But sometimes I think we're like those trucks and we fill up all these other people. We fill up these gas stations. We fill up these other people. But yet we forget to fill ourselves up. We forget to fill the truck up. We forget to fill our own gas tank. I know I'm guilty of this too, where it's sometimes it's like I'm too busy filling these other people at work and stuff, and I forget I need to be filled too. God needs to fill me too. I need to take time in His presence and be filled with Him. And so we need to make spending time with God a priority, just to get away, just to shut the door, and just worship Him and be in His presence. Spend time in His presence. And for us to pour our hearts out to Him in His presence. And read His Word. But also to let Him pour His heart out to us. We need to have those times just spending with Him. And to be filled and be to just feel restored. Because in that Psalm 23... It says, I won't lack nothing. When you're in His presence, you know He's with me. You know I'm going to lack nothing. You know He's going to lead me to the green pasture. He's going to provide for me. He's going to give me peace. He's going to give me rest. You know He provides for you when you're in His presence. When I am in His presence, I don't feel like nothing can hurt me. When you are praying, whenever you are worshiping God, you feel like you are invincible sometimes. I know I do when I am in His presence. But then we get out of His presence. That's when we start to worry. That's when we start to have these anxieties. That's when we have all these other things when we get out of His presence. And the thing is, is when we live in the world, we can't always, every man of every day, be in His presence in that way. But we got to make time to get in His presence, to refill our soul, to restore our soul time sometimes, for us to be refreshed for us to be filled again. And so let's pray this morning.
Well, precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for just this wonderful day you've given us. Yes. And Lord, today I just pray that, Lord, you would refresh us, you would restore our soul. Lord, if there's something going on in our lives, Lord, I pray we would come to you, the shepherd, the good shepherd, who provides for us. You will provide all of our needs for us. But Lord, we know that you'll provide all of our needs, but yet we know that we live in a fallen world, so things are going to go wrong. And Lord, we also know that each and every day we get older and older. So our bodies are falling apart. But Lord, we know that one day, though our bodies are wasting away now, we know that we're going to be restored on the other side. So Lord, I pray today that you would just give us peace. Lord, you would give us comfort. But Lord, most importantly, you would encourage all of us here to just keep going, keep being with you. Give us joy. Give us peace. Lord, help us to shift our perspective off of the world and onto you. Help us to shift our perspective to know that you are going to take care of us. No matter what comes, you are going to take care of us. You will provide for our needs. So Lord, as we leave here today, I pray that you would lead us. We would follow you. We would know your voice and we would follow and chase after you. Help us to know your voice. Help us to chase after you, the good shepherd. So Lord, I just pray that you would calm all of us here today. Whatever is we're anxious about, Lord, I pray you would just give us peace about those situations, peace about whatever it is. Because, Lord, we know that no matter what comes, nothing can separate us from you. So whatever I'm anxious about, I know that you know about, and I know you're going to take care of it. It might not be in the way that I want, but I know that you're going to handle it. Where it doesn't matter where I go, or anything that I know you are with me. You're leading me. And I can take comfort in knowing that you are there with me. Where even if I mess up, you're still going to pull me out. Because of your grace. Because of your mercy. Each and every time I come back to you. So Lord, I pray that you would just go with us and you would lead us. And Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.